Amen. So Romans chapter 1, keep your place there. We're going to be spending a lot of time there this morning. But we're talking about uh, Romans. First of all, Romans chapter 1 is definitely one of those chapters in the Bible where there's just a lot of depth there. It's one of those chapters where if you read it again and again, you'll just keep seeing more and more and more things. And I mean, the whole Bible's like that, but Romans chapter 1 especially has a lot of depth. There's just a lot of things in Romans chapter 1 that we can learn as we read it again and again and understand more about it. There's just a lot of explanations in Romans chapter 1 on why um, we see the things that we see in our world. So what are we talking about the last couple of Sundays? So we talked last Sunday, we're categorizing the whole world as according to God. God categorizes the world, you know, according to, we talked last Sunday morning on or neighbors, on neighbors. What, who is our neighbor? What does that mean? What does that mean for us? Um, who, who in the world is our neighbor? Um, you know, we tend to categorize people in the world as saved and unsaved. And I'm not saying that that's wrong. You know, from a, the perspective of a, of a soul winner, it's practical in many cases. But God really categorizes people in the categories of neighbors and enemies. So we talked about neighbors last Sunday morning, and this morning I want to talk to you about the topic of enemies. Of enemies. Who, who are our enemies? What are enemies, and how are we supposed to treat um, those enemies? You're there in Romans chapter 1. The first thing I want to go through is a Bible study on the two types of enemies that the Bible discusses. There's two types of enemies in the Bible. The first type are, are talked about in Romans chapter 1, and these are enemies of God. These are God's enemies. Now look, there's this idea out there that, you know, especially in liberal Christianity, Christianity over the last 10, 20 years, you know, as, as things have just gotten really loose with the Bible, that God loves everybody. And the Bible does not teach that. And the funny thing is, is that God loving everybody and this doctrine that says that God loves everybody is actually a stumbling block for many people. It's a stumbling block. It is something that actually stops people from wanting to believe and have faith in God. And you say, well, that sounds, you know, God loves everybody sounds good. Well, not really if you think about it for more than three seconds. Because a lot of people, and look, I have met people out soul winning that have, have asked me this question. I've met these types of people several times. People that will say, how could God allow, how could, how, how could God allow these people like serial killers or, you know, these molesters that are out there and just these evil people in the world? Look, it's, you know, these are questions that people ask. They don't want to believe in a God that would just love everyone, including all these wicked, horrible people. Because look, people can see the wicked and the evil with their very eyes. They can see it. They can see it happening. These are people, they're unsure if they want to believe in God or, or even want to know what the Bible says if this is kind of something that God allows. It's fighting, look, it's fighting their conscience, this idea about it, because what they're seeing in the world is, is what's happening. Loving everybody makes no sense. Whether we love everybody or God loves everybody, that makes no sense. As a matter of fact, it's actually evil to teach that. It's actually evil to teach that. And the liberal, liberal Christianity that, that does teach this is actually putting people in danger Amen. by doing so. And they're placing a stumbling block even more, even more wickedly. It's placing a stumbling block in front of people that might want to be interested in the Bible, interested in you know, what the gospel is. It's stopping people from coming to the knowledge of the truth right. is what it is. Right. And it's going against the very law written in people's hearts. I mean, it's, it's the person that's, they're not saved, they've never really even read the Bible much, and they're just like, how, how could God allow? They, they've seen something happen in their life, to, usually to someone that they love. Something wicked and evil has happened to someone that they love, and they, how could God allow that person or that thing to happen or these people to exist or whatever. It's their conscience. Look, you get a conscience. Everybody gets a conscience. Whether you were raised in a Christian home or not, you get a conscience. So look, it's going against that law. Look, even here, here's a funny thing. Even this liberal commentator, Bill Maher, and if you don't know who he is, don't look him up because he's a, he's a vulgar guy. But even, even Bill Maher says this last week, 
There's a news article when he was talking about you know, the, the war in Afghanistan and the pull out of Afghanistan, and he gave some dialogue, and he made this, he made this comment. And he was talking about, you know, the United States, the nation. But he said this, he said this, even liberals understand this. Anyone with any ounce of logic understands this. Here's what he said, quote, blind hatred is just as misguided as blind love. Agree. Everyone who has thought about this for a second understands this. But here's the good news, folks. God doesn't love everybody, okay? And this actually, if you remember the, look, at one point he loved everybody. And if you remember the sermon on the book of life, this is exactly how the book of life works. Everybody starts in the book of life. Everybody begins in the book of life. Go back to Romans chapter 1, or, or look at Romans chapter 1. It's super important that we understand this. God did love everybody, but as things stand now, God does not love everybody. And the first point I want to make as we look down at Romans chapter 1, I want you to look at verse 18. The first point I want to make is you're like, oh man, God, God doesn't love everybody? Here's the thing. God did not start it. God did not start it. Look at verse number 18 of Romans chapter 1. The Bible says we're just going to study through the last half of Romans chapter 1, and we're going to find out why you know, this has happened. Everybody started out being loved by God. Everybody started out in the book of life. They all had, remember, they all had those two things. Everybody had those two things from the beginning. No matter where you were born, no matter who, what family you were from, what country you were raised in, you all, everybody had, you know, the proof of creation. Everybody had that. And then Romans chapter 2 talks about everybody was given the law in their hearts, the, their conscience, the Bible calls it. Look at verse 18 of Romans chapter 1. God did not start it. It's not God's fault. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. So who's ungodly and unrighteous? It's not God, it's men that did this, who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Look, these people had the truth. They had it. They knew it, but they did not accept it. They rejected it. Look at verse 19. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has showed it to them, unto them. For the, and here's the creation. And this is how he showed it to them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead. So they are without excuse. Look, everybody can see the creation. You're living in it. You're walking through it every day. Verse number 21. Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful but became vain in their, own ima in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Vain means, that's a, that's a key word there as we see this transition happening. They rejected the truth of God, and then they became vain, which means they became focused not on God, they became focused on themselves. So everybody has the creation, everybody has their conscience from Romans chapter 2. And then they became vain. They let go of the truth of God. They rejected those things. They became vain. Instead of focusing on God and the things that God did and the eternal Godhead of the Lord and the creation, they, they focused on themselves. Right. And look at verse 22. And then it gets even further. You can see they became vain, and all of a sudden they're just, here they are, professing themselves to be wise. They became fools. They rejected the word of the Lord, and God made them fools for it. Proverbs 9.10, I'll just read for you. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the holy is understanding. They became fools because they went against this. As you lose the fear of the Lord, God will turn you into a fool. You can see that demonstrated. I've, I've preached sermons on that. You can see that demonstrated over and over again in your life as a Christian. But now it gets even worse. You say, okay, they rejected they rejected the truth of God. They were not thankful for their life. You know, because look, you and I are part of the creation. You were created. Hello. So they were not thankful for their life. They were not thankful for the creation, the larger creation around them. They professed themselves to be wise. They became vain. It came about them. Look at verse 23. But now it gets really bad. Because God hates this. And this could be a whole sermon in itself and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man and to birds and to four-footed beasts and to creeping things. They changed God. They changed God. And twice we see this. Look at verse 24. Wherefore, 
for this reason, because of this, God gave, also gave them up to uncleanness through the lusts of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. And then verse number 25, the Bible says again, it says, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. They committed a very serious offense here, which is why God says it twice. They changed God. They changed who God was, and then they changed what God said. They changed the truth of God. They changed the word of the Lord. The Bible says, I am the Lord. I change not. And if you haven't figured one thing out from the Bible, the people that change the word of God, it says at the end of the Bible itself, if people take away or add from or add to my words, he's like, they're done. They're done. I'll take away their part from the book of life. So they committed a very serious offense here by changing God. And then in verse 24, it says, God gave them up to uncleanness. So it's interesting that just normal people that are unsaved, you know, God keeps them in a certain state. This implies in verse number 24 that because of the fact that these people changed God, they rejected God, and they focused only on themselves, and they were not thankful to God, and then they actually changed who God was, they changed the truth of God, that he just he let go of that protection. And he just let, them, he just let their hearts just lead them into the lowest darkness. It's kind of like a, a God's a safety net for most people. That's kind of how I think about it. God is a safety net. You're not saved, but you're, uh, you know, you're not, you don't really think one way or the other about God. Maybe you believe in God, maybe you don't. Uh, maybe you don't know much about the Bible. You're just kind of indifferent about it. There's a safety net that God holds those people in. With these people, God took the safety net away. He just let whatever, whatever. Just let them go into whatever they were going to go into. Look at verse 26. Now it gets even worse. Because they changed the truth of God into a lie. For this cause. See, God didn't start it. Back to my first point. God did not start it. God did not just choose some people and not choose other people. It's because of what these men did. Right. For this cause, God gave them up to vile, unto vile affections. For even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman. You know, I, I have in my Bible, I have every time that the, the Bible uses the word natural or against nature or not convenient, I have that underlined. And it's five times. You'll see it. So it's repeated. It's not just repeated twice. This idea of nature, natural, against nature, unnatural is repeated five times in these, these verses. Look at verse um, 28. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind. That means a rejected mind. And to do those things which are not convenient. Not convenient means not natural. Amen. Being filled. And now look at this list. Being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, deceit malignity, whisperers, Backbiters, here's the big one, here's the enemies, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parent. Look, these people got to the point and God took away that safety net because of what they did to him, where they got to the point where they literally hate God. They literally hate God. They are evil. Look, I hate to break it to you this morning, but there are evil people out there. Folks. And you may not hear this from many churches today, but, every, but the, the funny thing is, everybody knows it. Everybody knows it. You don't have to watch the news for too long or read too much in the news from just yesterday or the day before to know that there's evil people out there. Look at verse 31. Without understanding, covenant breakers, without what? Natural affection, implacable, unmerciful. And the one thing that comes out of this, the one thing that I, I, look, there's so much confusion about this today, but the one thing to really narrow this down is to use what God said five times here. He said five times, he said natural and unnatural. As far as affections, you know, here's the thing. What's natural and what's unnatural? If you look at the very first time that the word was used, here's all you have to know. You don't have to go out and study 
all the different unnatural things that are coming out every single year because the list is just going to keep growing and growing and growing. All you have to know is there's two categories. There's natural and there's unnatural. A man and a woman is natural Amen. and everything else is unnatural. Amen. That's all you have to know. As far as affections, that's all you have to know. You don't have to go out and study the 105 different perversions or whatever there are. It's all in the unnatural category. If it's all, the only comparison you have to do is if it's, a, it's an affection that's not a man and a woman, it's unnatural. And here's another thing. Everybody knows that. Everybody knows that. Why? Because they have a conscience. Because it's written in their heart. So look, they may be being influenced by media and being influenced by all these things, but everybody knows that it's unnatural. So you, you just have to know that. And this is why, this is why we don't allow homosexuals in this church. Amen. This is why. Right here, Romans chapter 1, this explanation. But look, really, it's not just that. It's anything unnatural is not going to be allowed in this church. Look, folks, it's not natural to be a serial killer. It's not, look at the last uh, verse. Look at the, um, look at the last verse of Romans chapter 1. The second to last verse. No, I'm sorry, the last sentence of Romans chapter 1. It says, they which commit such things are worthy of death not only do the same, but look at the last verse there. But they have pleasure in them that do them. You're saying all murderers? No, look, here's the thing. Here's the thing. Somebody that goes and, and gets into sin and goes and has too much to drink and gets in their car and actually ends up killing somebody with their car, that's a terrible thing. That's murder. But that is not something, they did not have pleasure in, you know, they were not going out murdering people for pleasure. Okay, they were not out murdering people for profit. Like, you know, the abortion doctor. This is not some, I mean, that is, that's a different category. That is somebody, somebody that could go to work every day and murder babies every single day for money. That is not natural. That is an unnatural thing. Because most normal people would see that. Do you know how many people I have gotten to be pro-life when I was younger just by showing them what an actual abortion is? They're like, whoa! I'm not for that! As you see some dismembered human being in a garbage can, it's unnatural. It's sick. It makes you. It gives you like. It gives you like a, a, a twisted feeling in your stomach, and it just it breaks your heart. So somebody that can go and do that for a living is not a natural person. It's it's not a natural thing. So that is what we have to watch for. But back to the point I'm trying to make. People have become God's enemies in Romans chapter 1. We see how it happened. We see the process that happened. But look, they started it. You can't pin this on God. And look, that is a, that God actually has enemies and actually is against these people and is going to punish these people. That is a comfort for people. That is a comfort for people that have had, had run-ins with these wicked people in their lives. So look, it, it would be wicked if God like, loved serial killers, inventors of evil things, people that would hurt children, all these unnatural people. You know, turn to Luke chapter 17. You're like, oh, but Jesus, but Jesus loves everyone. Well, Jesus is God. They're the same, first of all. And, and, and the answer is No. The answer is no. Jesus, you know who Jesus loves? Jesus loves the children. That's who Jesus loves. Look at Luke chapter 17. Look at Luke chapter 17 and verse number 2. Jesus is talking about someone that would, would, would uh, by offend here, he means commit an offense against. He's talking about somebody that would, that would commit an offense against a child. This is, what, this is what Jesus thinks about that. Jesus says it would be better for him, this is the person that committed an offense against a child, it would be better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and he cast into the sea than that he should offend one of these little ones. He's saying it would be better if they were drowned in the ocean. Amen. And he didn't say we should drown them in the ocean. He said it would be better. Yeah, right. Because when I get them, it's going to be much worse. Amen. That's, what Je that's what Jesus is saying. This is Jesus. And look, this is comforting. This is comforting for people, knowing that, knowing that yes, no matter what our society allows, 
No matter what our society allows, that Jesus is going to take care of it in the end. That God will take care of it in the end. And now look, we could go on and on about this, but I want to, the point I'm trying to make is God has enemies. God has enemies. And there are people that have turned against Him. They are unnatural, meaning their conscience is gone. And look, science will tell you this too. Science will tell you this, that there are people where their conscience is gone. They don't have one. Life Science, LifeScience.com has that, and you'll, you can find this statistic pretty, pretty consistent throughout most scientific studies that, you know, the definition of a psychopath basically is somebody that doesn't have a conscience. Somebody that just has no feelings, as they will say, towards other people. And, and LifeScience.com and most other studies put it at about 1% of people. Think about that. One out of every 100 people out there is a psychopath. Somebody that does not have a conscience. Now, does that mean that 1% that of people are serial killers? No, but it means that they have the capability to. It means that, you know, most people that, you know, the reason that that 1%, they're mostly not serial killers is because of self-preservation. You'll, you'll find that in corporate America that you will find this type of person that's just really good at getting to the top because they don't care about ethics or morality or who they hurt or whatever. And, you know, they're not a serial killer because they like their nice life. They don't want to go to jail. They don't want to go to prison, whatever. And, but they use it to get them. To, I'm not saying every person that's successful. But look, you will find this in, you know, people in successful positions because they're not playing. Look, I'm playing by a different set of rules. I can't do unethical things. I can't hurt people and step on people because, look, I'm, I'm guided by my conscience, the Bible, you know, whatever ethical rules I put in place you know, for myself, and my conscience is there telling me, you can't do that, that's not right. You can't lie about that person to get that promotion, that's not the right thing to do. So most people won't do it. But 1% of people will, which is why they will get ahead in many different situations. But look, it's, it doesn't mean they're all serial killers, it just means they have the capability. And look, if, you're, if, you, if you pay attention to this, you might be able to pick some out in your life. I've, I've picked out a few in my life. You can watch for things. You can watch for unnatural things. You know, people that just don't care for morality on any level. And, you know, you'll notice it. All right? So look, there's another kind of God's enemies. So we see um, a, a set of, of how people become God's enemies in verse, um, in Romans chapter 1. But I want to focus down in kind of a, a subcategory of God's enemies. Turn to 2 Peter chapter 2. 2 Peter chapter 2. There's another kind of God's enemies. Um, it's not as easy to identify these people as God's enemies, but the Bible does say, and this goes back to Romans chapter 1 where it was talking about the people that changed um, God's word, changed the truth of God. You will see um, a category of God's enemies that are false prophets. Look at 2 Peter chapter 2. 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse number 1. Look what the Bible says. The Bible says this. It says, but there were false prophets also among the people even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord. There you go again. They knew the Lord. They denied Him, though. They knew the, what God's Word said. They denied it. They changed it. Denied the Lord that bought them and bring upon themselves swift destruction. And many shall follow their pernicious ways. Now, pernicious means very harmful but subtle. So pernicious is very bad. It's somebody that's, that's very harmful, that's trying to do hurt, but they're very subtle about it. So these are a, a particular dangerous set of God's enemies here. If you look at 2 Peter chapter 2, 2 Peter chapter 2, a lot of people can be confused by 2 Peter chapter 2. It's basically talking about two groups of people in 2 Peter chapter 2. If you just want to make a little bit of a note. I'm not going to study through the whole chapter. There's two groups of people. It's talking about these false prophets they bring up at the beginning, and it's talking about the people that they hurt throughout the chapter, especially at the end of the chapter. It's talking about the people that they actually pull away from the gospel. Okay, so there's two groups that are talked about in 2 Peter chapter 2. False prophets and the people that they pull away. And it's because they're pernicious. They're pernicious. They're subtly harmful. They're very good at it. By reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. And through, in verse number 3, it tells us, you know, one of the reasons that they do it. It says, and through covetousness shall they with feigned words make merchandise of you. 
whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not. This is why Balaam, who we talked about on Wednesday, is brought up in 2 Peter chapter 2. Because the way of Balaam is the way of greed. It's the way of covetousness. That's what got Balaam into all his trouble. He just had to get back and get the money somehow. So, two groups of people. False prophets and the people that they hurt in 2 Peter chapter 2. That's just a, a, a side note. But, false prophets can be enemies of God. And I say can be. Why? Why? The difference is this. You can't say that every false prophet is someone who's rejected by God. You say why? Well, because of the Bible. Look at Acts chapter 8. Let me give you a tale of two sorcerers in the Bible. Let me give you a tale of two false prophets in the Bible. And then I'll point out, I'll give you some characteristics of false prophets where you can kind of gauge whether or not, okay, this is, a, this is an enemy of God right here. Okay? But look, there's two sorcerers talked about in the book of Acts. These are, these are false prophets. They're teaching false things. They're teaching witchcraft or whatever they're doing. Look at Acts chapter 8 and verse number 9. Look what the Bible says. So this is the first one. But there was a certain man called Simon, which before time in the same city used sorcery and bewitched the people of Samaria. Sounds like a bad guy. Giving out that himself was some great one to whom they all gave heed for at least, from the least to the greatest thing. This man is the great power of God. So he's using witchcraft, and they're thinking that he has the, the power of God. And to him, they had regard because that of long time he had bewitched them with sorceries. So look, he's, he's doing, he's dealing in, in, you know, demonic things, sorceries here. This is bad stuff. Okay, but look at the Bible in verse number 12. But when they, be, but when they believed Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God... In the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Then Simon himself believed also. And when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and wondered, beholding the miracles and signs which were done. And look, they had some cultural things to get out of this guy, if you keep reading. But the point is, this guy got saved. I mean, this guy was a, was a false prophet, a sorcerer, and he got saved. He got saved. Look at, now turn to Acts chapter 13. So we can see that, you know, we can't just kind of label people enemies of God just given over just because they're a false prophet because we see that, you know, this guy got saved. So it's possible that they could get saved, okay? Turn to Acts chapter 13. And I'm going to give you kind of a philosophy on how to, how to, you know, gauge enemies as we get towards the end of the sermon. But look at Acts chapter 13. Let's look at the second um, sorcerer in Acts chapter 13. Look what the Bible says in verse number 5. And when they were at Salamis, they preached the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews. And they had also John to their minister. And when they had gone through the Isle of Paphos, they found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew whose name was Bar-Jesus, which was with the deputy of the country. So this guy's with another guy. Okay, so this false prophet, this sorcerer, is with another guy, the deputy of the country, Sergius Paulus, a prudent man who called for Barnabas and Saul and desired to hear the word of God. So you have, you have Bar-Jesus and um, this uh, Paulus guy. And they're together, and Paulus says to, to Paul, he's like, come, come tell me the, the word of God. He says to uh, Barnabas and Saul, you desire to hear the word of God. But Elimus, now this is another name for Bar-Jesus, the sorcerer, for so is his name by interpretation, withstood them, seeking to turn away the deputy from the face. So this is the difference right here. This is the difference right here. Then Saul, who is also called Paul, filled with the Holy Ghost, set his eyes on him and said... Oh, full of subtleties. There's, there's that perniciousness right there. These false prophets, they never really come out and just say, hey, you know, here's what I think, and here's what I think is different than what you think. And they're never really in your faith. They're very subtle, and they're very pernicious, the Bible would say. He said, and full of all subtlety and mischief, thou child of the devil, thou enemy of all righteousness, wilt thou not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord? Paul, I mean, really just hands it to this guy, calls him a child of the devil. And, but the difference is this. The difference is this. He says, enemy of all righteousness, thou child of the devil. He, look, he, he's, he's trying to actively stop someone from hearing the truth. That's the difference. That's the difference. And look, you, 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 you can kind of pick this out with people. Let me give you an example in, in my life. Before I was even saved, we were Lutheran. We were Lutheran. And we lived in Texas at the time. And uh, the Baptists are big in Texas. You know, I have to kind of give credit, by the way, to the Texas law. I'm sure it was the Baptists pushing that. 
down there. It was, you know, they call it the Bible Belt for a reason. So, you know, thank God for those people down there. But the point is, I had a Lutheran pastor of a church that we were in, in Texas, and he really had no issues with the Baptists. He liked the Baptist people. He talked great about the Baptists. The Baptists were the ones knocking doors. As a matter of fact, I had many conversations with this Lutheran pastor you know, about the Baptists that would go out and hand out materials and knock on people's doors and just be like, kind of like, yeah, you know, it seems like maybe they're doing what the Bible says they should do. I even kind of said that to, my, to this pastor. He's like, yeah, you know, that's a good thing and all that. And I never really took it much further than that. But he had no problems with the Baptists, this guy. But, I mean, you could say he's a false prophet. I mean, he's, he's, got, a, he's, he's got a church with a, with a false gospel. You know, I, and I, I think about that man a lot. You know, and, and my wife and I talk about that man a lot. But look, he had no problems with, with the, the Baptists, the Christians. Then we moved um, to North Dakota. And we ended up in a Lutheran church. And this pastor, actually, I, I was not saved. I was not saved for another year or so after this, but this pastor was constantly ripping on Baptists. I left the church for that one reason. I left the church for that one reason because I said, look, these people are Christians. He's like, I don't know what you think about these people, but they're going to be in heaven with us. You know, I didn't know that, you know, my state at the time, but I, I, I never one time in my life thought that a Baptist was going to hell, ever. And, you know, this guy was just constantly making fun of them and all this, this Lutheran pastor, and I'm just like, Hey, you know, that, this isn't right. These people are Christians. And, you know, but you know what that was? That wasn't my great example or my great Bible knowledge because I didn't really have much at that point. It was my conscience. It was a law written in my heart. I knew that what they were doing was according to what was in my heart. And this guy was going against that. It was so, it was so bad we left. We left the church um, for that reason. So look, I mean, there's two examples that I can give you right there of false prophets. One that may have been an enemy of God and one that probably wasn't, you know. But another one is, you know, Brother Frank and I were out soul winning one time. We ran into a, a pastor on the street. And this pastor, he came up to us and he's like, oh, what are you guys doing? And he's like, oh, we're from, uh, you know, this Baptist church and we're passing out um, invitations and letting people know how they can go to heaven and all this. And then there's a bunch of guys playing basketball over there. And there's a lot of people out on the streets this day. And this pastor, he came up to us and he's, he was just super friendly to our face. Brother Frank, do you remember this? He was super friendly to our face. And then we went in and we started knocking doors in the neighborhood. And Brother Frank heard this guy telling, going around to all the people out on the street saying, yeah, they're, gonna be, they're asking you for money. They're just trying to raise money. They're going to they're gonna try to get money out of you. Wow. Look, that's a bar Jesus right there. That's somebody who's trying to sink the gospel. That's a child of the devil. And Brother Frank and I, we, just, we made the connection to Acts chapter 13 right away. Because look, you'll see it. You'll see it. You'll see when you'll be giving the gospel out to people, you will see people that are maybe leaders of a church or a pastor or something that are just like, they're not going to let you give the gospel. They're, I mean, that's bar Jesus. You'll, you'll find those people. You'll, you'll think of those people. So look, God has enemies to bring it all back around. And thankfully, you know, we have a just God. And because we know evil exists in the world, God does not love everyone. It fits. It fits our conscience. Turn to Psalm 139. Turn to Psalm 139. It fits our conscience. And I'm very thankful that, that, I mean, God made my conscience. So, I mean, it makes sense that, you know, the Bible says that he behaves according to that. Look at Psalm chapter 139 and verse number 21. Psalm 139 and verse number 21. So we're supposed to back to the whole sermon series. We're supposed to love our neighbor. We're supposed to love our neighbor, but God has enemies. These people are not our neighbor, is what I'm getting at here. Look at Psalm chapter 139, verse 21. The Bible says, Do I not hate them, O Lord, that hate thee? The people that hate the Lord are God's enemies, we just learned about. Am I not grieved with those that rise up against thee? Look, that's why they're God's enemies, because they're actively working against God. Bar Jesus, actively working against God. And he says, I hate them. But then in verse number 22, we really see, you know, the, 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 the conclusion of the matter right here. I hate them with a perfect hatred. I count them mine enemies. So really the first part of that, that perfect, you know what that perfect means? Righteous. It means I hate them with a righteous hatred. Look, there is a righteous hatred. There's a righteous hatred. Even liberals understand this. 
from the, you know, the saying of Bill Maher, just blindly loving everybody and blindly hating everybody is folly. That's exactly what the Bible teaches. That's exactly what the Bible teaches. So there's a righteous hatred, and that hatred is towards the enemies of the Lord, the Bible says. Now, go to Matthew chapter 5. There's another type of enemy. So we see that there's enemies of God. There's enemies of God. Not God's fault. Not God's fault. But then look at Matthew chapter 5. There's personal enemies. There's your enemies. There's my enemies. There's personal enemies. Look at Matthew chapter 5 and verse 44. So there's a righteous hatred towards God's enemies. How about my enemies? Look at Matthew chapter 5 and verse 44. The Bible says, But I say unto you, Love your enemies. Now, notice how the Bible doesn't say, because I mean, we could have a contradiction if the Bible said, love my enemies. But it says, love your enemies. This is your personal enemies, by the way. These are not God's enemies. These are your personal enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you, not me. God's not saying, don't do good to them that hate me. He says, do good to them that hate you and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. So there's a difference between God's enemies and your enemies. These people hate you, not God, is the, what the Bible is talking about in Matthew chapter 5. Now look, you're supposed to, and, and the difference is you're supposed to love the people that hate you. <laughs> you're like, oh man, that's a hard thing to do. Turn to Proverbs chapter 25. But there's a big difference there. And you've got to make sure, and I'm going to talk about you know, risk management in your life, that we don't blur these lines. Okay, look at Proverbs chapter 20, 25. That's a hard thing to do. Somebody that, that uses you, that's despiteful towards you, that is just, you know, that just hates you, and you're supposed to love them. It's like, but God, look, God gives us some comfort here in Proverbs chapter 25 and verse 21. If thine enemy, that means your enemy, be hungry, give him bread to eat. If he be thirsty, give him water to drink. For thou shalt heap coals of fire upon his head, and the Lord shall reward thee. So the Bible says, if you do what I say, I'll reward you, and, and it'll drive them nuts. <laughs> That's what he's saying here. He's like, look, God's saying, hey, the best way for you to, you know, it'll drive people crazy. If they just hate you, because you know what they want? They want you to hate them back. Right. People that are just mad and just upset at you, and they just really don't like you, they, just, they want you to just... Get down in the mud with them. Somebody told me one time that, you know, don't get down in the mud with the pigs because the pigs like it when you get down in the mud with them. So somebody do, eat, doing evil to you, you're supposed to be nice back. So who are these people that could be doing evil to you? Look, they could be saved or they could be unsaved. These people that are your enemies. That's the funny thing. And the mistake that people make, look, there, here's this huge mistake that people make, and I think that people need to think about this more. But... People misunderstand how wicked saved people can be. People have a fundamental misunderstanding of that. And I mean, look, a, a, a Christian, somebody who's saved, can be spiritual with the Lord, and then they can get backslidden and just become a wicked person. I mean, look, you've got you to think about the Bible. Think about the Bible. Saul. King Saul murdered 85 priests. I mean, think about that. I mean, think about if you heard about some person that killed a bunch of pastors. I mean, you'd be like, that guy is an enemy of God. For sure. Look, Saul was saved. Saul was saved. Look, you got two people, two, could two saved people hate each other? Is that possible? Of course it's possible. Look at Saul and David. I mean, you had Saul, like, literally just, just full of burning hatred towards David. I mean, but the thing is, does everyone that hate you hate God? Is the thing that you have to ask yourself. I mean, some people just don't like each other. That's the first thing. <laughs> I mean, some people just don't like each other. You ever met somebody that just doesn't like you? I mean, maybe it's your personality or whatever. They just don't like you. But saved people cannot like you. Now, I mean, ideally in a perfect world where you have two saved people that are both following the Bible and never get in the flesh, they should never end up hating each other. I agree. 
But the problem is that people get backslidden, people go against the Bible, people get in the flesh, many times there's both sides, and you end up with two saved people hating each other. And look, saved people, look, the thing is, you're not saved by anything you do. Being saved has nothing to do with the type of person you are. It has nothing to do with the character that you have. It's about what you have trusted in, what you believe. So, saved people can hate each other. I, I hate to report that, but it, it can happen. It does happen. And we have to make sure that we don't take our personal enemies and make them enemies of God. Because there's a temptation to do that. So let's just recap very quickly. We see that there's enemies of God. The traits in Romans chapter 1, we see that they're, they're unnatural people. They're false prophets. You know, the Pharisees are another good example of this. A lot of the Pharisees fall into this false prophets. Um, Jesus didn't even want them to get saved anymore. He said to the disciples, he said, look, I'm, I speak in these parables because, you know, they might end up understanding if I don't. <laughs> you know? He didn't want them to get it. He didn't want them to get it because they, they were given over. He was done. They were done. So, look, not, pe not all people that believe in false doctrine are enemies of God. And we're going to find those people and we're going to get those people saved all the time. I mean, there could be false prophets also that are just sincerely wrong. You know, and uh, th those are some people, I can think of some people that I've met. I have kind of gave you some examples. But if you, try to, if you find somebody specifically trying to stop you from getting someone saved, that, that's a different story. And, you know, I'm comfortable attaching that God's enemy label in that case, okay? But let's talk about making your personal enemies God's enemies. Because we're going to talk about, just at the end of the sermon, I want to talk about some risk management for you for your life. Here's the application for you today. All right, here's the application of, of how you can mitigate risk in your life. Because look, here's the thing. I'm going to explain to you why I have a philosophy that I have where I give people the benefit of the doubt. It's not because I'm super spiritual. It's not because I know more than anybody else. It's personal protection for me. Okay, and I'm going to explain that to you. Here's the personal risk of having a loose enemy policy. That's what I, that's what I call it. Right? Where you just take every person that hates me is you know, an enemy of God and you know, God hates them too and all this. And look, because I get it, your flesh, you want to do that. All right? But look, let's say I have a personal enemy. I mean, like we really hate each other. Like, I really hate this person, he hates me, to the point where I wish that person the worst, and I declare them an enemy of God. Turn to Matthew, or turn to Luke chapter 6. There's two possible problems here, for me, personally. There's two possible problems. And I'm talking about personal risk management for you this morning. Look at Luke chapter 6. First of all, I'm not following Matthew chapter 5, which we've already read, where Jesus says, love your enemies. Luke chapter 6, verse 27 says, but I say unto you which, which hear, uh, you which hear, love your enemies, and do good to them which hate you, and bless them that curse you, and pray for them that despitefully use you. So the first thing that you're not doing is if you make your enemies God's enemies, is you're not following Jesus' command. You're not following what Jesus said. I mean, have a saved person doing evil to me like David did, and then I make them God's enemy. I'm just not listening to God. That's the first thing. The second thing is this. Turn to 1 John chapter 4. 1 John chapter 4. We're going to go to 1 John chapter 4 and then 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 4 and verse number 20, the Bible says. And the second risk is this. So number one, I'm not listening to Jesus. And number two, I could end up hating my brother. I could end up unknowingly hating my brother. Look at 1 John chapter 4. And the Bible says that if I do that, there's consequences for me. Look at 1 John chapter 4 and verse number 20. If a man say, I love God, and hateth his brother, he's a liar. So first of all, that makes me a liar. Now go to chapter 2 of 1 John. 1 John chapter 2. And this is the worst one right here. 1 John chapter 2 and verse 11. So if I have a personal enemy and I'm like, there's no way, I, I hate this guy so much, he does wicked things, and all these things, and like I said, saved people can do wicked things. Saved people can do really wicked things. Yeah. And that's, I mean, people need to realize that for, for protection for themselves. Look at 1 John chapter 2. The Bible says, he that hateth his brother is in darkness, and walketh in darkness, and knoweth not where he goeth, because that darkness has blinded his eyes. Look, the Bible says that God will make you blind if you hate your brother. 
You will, look, and I've seen this play out. If you hate your brother and you declare your brother God's enemy, first of all, that doesn't make him God's enemy. You don't have the power to do that. What that does is it makes you hate your brother when you don't even know it. But God sees that you hate your brother. That's what God sees. And here's the thing. You will do and you will say foolish things. You will be walking in darkness. I mean, two Christians fighting. One is way over the top. Look at, you know, David and Saul. I mean, look, look at Saul. He became like a madman. He was like a, he was, I mean, it's a perfect example of this in the Bible. He became, he was like a crazy person. To the point where God took him home. Yeah. To the point where he's like, God's just like, I'm, I'm done. You're, you're, you're going to die now. I'm going to kill you. <laughs> you know, God took him home. He took him to heaven, but he took him off this earth. He's like, you're, you're a nutcase. So look, Jesus' advice on our personal enemies, it protects us. You see? Right. It's protection for us. Loving your enemies protects you personally from consequences. And personally, that's why I err on the side of caution here. Because just as you have misjudged, I mean, you ever misjudge if somebody, was, you know, out, out soul winning, you ever misjudge if somebody was saved? Have you ever done that in your life? You can misjudge if someone's not saved just as easily. Because we can't see the heart. We can't see the heart. I'll say that out soul winning. Before I, I say a prayer with somebody, I'll be like, you know what, I can't see your heart. But if you do believe these things, God sees your heart. Amen. All right, so we can misjudge who is not saved just as easily as we can misjudge who is. I say that to people soul winning all the time. So look, identify and avoid God's enemies according to the Bible. The unnatural. This church policy, there will never be an unnatural person in this church. Amen. Ever. Amen. Ever. It's, it's for safety. And it would be pointless anyway. They've been given up. Those who would hinder the gospel. You know, we have to kind of just, you know, false doctrine in the church. 2 Peter chapter 2. We kind of have to just, we don't have to be paranoid, but we don't have to be blind either. You know, because the Bible says it's going to be subtle. People are going to bring in false doctrines. They're going to, you know, you know we just kind of keep, keep our eyes open. Everybody else, we just love everybody else. It's pretty simple. Neighbor, brother, personal enemies, just love them all. That's what the Bible says. So look, people that don't like us or we don't like them, you know, there's, just love them anyway. There's safety there. There's safety there. It's, it's not for them, it's for you. It's for me to just give people the benefit of the doubt. You know, people aren't unnatural. They're not false prophets. You know, it's, it's best to just err on the side of, of neighbor <laughs> for, for, your own, for your own sake. So that's neighbor's and enemies, folks. You know, look, we're, we're the only ones we're not to love. It's pretty simple. And that's why it's kind of nice to, to categorize the world in that, that way, neighbors and enemies, because it's simpler for us as our actions go forward, because the only ones we're not to love are God's enemies. That's it. That's it. Everybody else, um, we're to love and, and do good to them. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly